Then we shorten the list based on a number of criteria about impact, about ease of the implementation, about maturity of the innovation, and through that, we ended up with the 10 urban innovations. And if you think about the city today, there's a lot of um, space which is uh, unused during most of the day or during most of the year, but still, we want to give it to one function. By overlapping different functions, we can actually use space in a more efficient way. So have higher density, lower energy consumption per capita in a more sociable environment. Today we can monitor the water network in a, in a very, very precise way. It's about looking at leaks, looking about what people consume and so on. So basically, if you combine the water system with, say, the internet and develop something like you could call the water net, then we're able to do two important things. The first one is to manage such a precious resource better, but the second one is to get feedback back to people in order to change behavior. And so trees are very important for both from environmental reasons, but also um, for the pleasure of being in a green environment as we move outside in cities. So the idea again is, can you combine networks and social networks with the presence of trees? Can you map trees? Can you allow people to take action? Create almost like a social network for trees in the way that, you know, you empower people to, to take responsibility of the green canopy, but also to ask politicians to improve it and to compare one city with another one. That can become a very far important tool both to monitor the green canopy and to improve it. The bicycle itself can, can be transformed by IT. And actually, one of the projects we did here at the Sensible City Lab called the Copenhagen Wheel is, is doing a bicycle wheel that can turn every bike into, into an e-bike. If you got all the information about how cyclists move in the city, then they can become very powerful in order to decide where to do a new bicycle path. So somehow, all this digital information can help, can help us to design better the city so that it is more friendly to cyclists. It is very simple, is that if you're generating, say, electricity, you're releasing a lot of heat as a byproduct. And that heat can be used for heating and for cooling as well at the district level. So if you're able to look at all the flows of heat in the city and combine them in the most effective way, we can actually overall save a lot of energy. Today we know that thanks to digital, it's much easier to share. Think about sharing a car, or think about sharing an apartment, an Airbnb. And so the idea is how can we develop digital platforms that allow us to share in the city at a much broader scale. Many pieces of infrastructure for living, for uh, working, for moving, most of that is used for some of the time, but not for all the time. So if we're able to share more, we can save a lot and the aggregate them. And, and the interesting thing about self-driving car is not necessarily the fact that you don't need to keep your hands on the steering wheel. But a self-driving car can give you a lift in the morning when you go to office, and then can give a lift to somebody else in your family or to anybody else in the city. So what you're doing effectively is creating a system which blurs public and private transportation. And Medellin has found a way to actually bring public spaces into informal settlements in order to reconnect those pockets with the rest of the city. And that, that you can call like the Medellin model, is what has been now widely used, being widely used all across the world.
And when you think about this, first of all, is physical connections, think about cable cars connecting the favelas, uh, an informal settlement with the rest of the city, but also other type of connections. Having a library means like a cultural connection, allowing people to exchange and, you know, even visually, uh, that are, those are very important symbolic connections in order to make the whole city work as a whole. It's about going from uh, traditional lighting to LEDs, saving a lot of energy. And so you can do this in the city. The first thing you can do is actually reduce energy consumption. But then when you put LEDs and maybe you put them online, so they are addressable, they're connected to the Internet of Things ecosystem, then those street lights can also do many other things. Think about monitoring air quality, or occupancy, or traffic, or becoming you know, smart intersections. So all of this turns the lighting infrastructure potentially into an intelligent web in the city. We will never be able to produce all the food that's needed in New York, just in New York. There's simply not enough space and not enough sun falling on New York. So what we can do, yes, is still bring a lot of urban agriculture into the city. And that's very important, not necessarily for the quantity of, of food, but it's very important because it connects us with, uh, with nature, with seasons, with production itself, with things that we've been doing as humans for thousands of years. And so that, per se, is one of the crucial components of urban farming. I don't think we can actually say today confidently how cities in the future will look like. But what we can do is actually all together work in order to, to see which way to develop the future city. Vodafone One.